uh, thank you very much for, for having me here. Uh, so what I'd like to do with this presentation is open up a conversation about intercommunal violence, which is becoming a kind of category that is increasingly prominent in a lot of both academic and policy and grey literature on, on violence in Africa. And we're starting to see it in, in, in a variety of subfields on local peace building, on post-conflict security, and in particularly in Malthusian claims about climate change and conflict as well. I don't think this is desirable. I don't, I don't think the term is particularly good. I think it is l imbued with a lot of meaning that we should be a bit more aware of and cautious of uh, when we use it. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. We're going to look at the meaning and origins of, of, of intercommunal violence. Then we're going to look at some of the problems uh, that accompany the use of, of, of the term. And then finally, time permitting, get onto a, a, a way of potentially overcoming some, some of these problems. Okay, so what is intercommunal violence? I, I, we'll come back to the origins in a, in a moment on the next slide. But for now, it's worth thinking about what it was replacing. And because this term is relatively recent in, in kind of uh, African studies, and that is because it ended up replacing the kind of new wars and ethnic wars discourses of the 1990s and 2000s. Now, these haven't completely gone away, but, but they are much less prominent compared to their, their heyday. Uh, they both had a number of problems. New wars generally criticized for its, uh, its mistreatment of history um, and, and questionable empirics. Uh, ethnic conflicts for, at least in the cruder accounts, for kind of essentializing uh, conflicts and raising more questions and answers about conflict dynamics. And I would see intercommunal violence as a kind of softer revival of some of these themes that de-emphasizes the kind of identity or ethnicity aspects, but retains uh, certain other aspects or, or re-emphasizes, particularly the centrality of militias um, to understanding modern conflicts, as well as uh, a kind of set of, of, of assumptions and claims about conflicts being essentially decentralized. The state doesn't have that much of a role in it, and they're largely apolitical. They're not really about much. Okay, so definitions of intercommunal violence, th th there are some that exist, but they tend to all point to different aspects of the same sort of phenomenon. You could, in, even in cases where they don't really define, where authors don't really define what's going on, you can kind of infer what they mean. And that is a type of violence primarily between non-states, irregular youth militias over what are essentially local issues uh, often occurring at the, the outskirts, the fringes of state power in relatively anarchic environments or alternatively taking the form of kind of mob violence in, in, in urban contexts. Now, the term originates in 1890s uh, British imperial accounts of violence between uh, riots between Hindus and Muslims in India. That's that's where it actually comes from, uh, and it was used to present this violence as being kind of spontaneous violence between two relatively evenly matched groups. Uh, that was not necessarily the case in reality, and it was used to uh, to exonerate colonial uh, rulers from any role in this violence. It was because th these were communities who were engaging in it. They would have done so with or without colonialism was the kind of the, the implication uh, with, with, within that. Now, this, it then the, the term or the language of communalism entered into Indian mainstream dis political discourse in the 1920s and 30s, where for uh, those those advocating for for, for, for independence for, uh, from for free from freedom from colonial rule, the t communalism was something that needed to be overcome. For those who are more sympathetic to the British imperial project, it was something um, the the was a powerful argument against hasty kind of independence. Now, the many scholars, Indian and, and non-Indian, have have extensively criticised the the. the the assumptions implicit within uh, the, the kind of language of, of intercommunal violence. Uh, in particular, one of the main problems is the way in which it wrote out elites who were actually orchestrating a lot of this violence. Uh, 
um, in later incarnations in post-independence India, the complicity of security forces in this violence also tended to be written out. And the violence was generally more one-sided, uh, typically against Muslims, than being a kind of a contest between two evenly matched forces. So I think the term has a lot of baggage with it. It's quite a loaded term. It tends to uh, be used as a way of, I would say, in insulting a society, claiming it's backward. Um, and I think that we probably should be cautious about, about that. But I think also it risks uh, smuggling in a number of distortions and misrepresentations of what's actually happening with the violence. And that, I think, is um, being carried across into, into its use in Africa more recently. So two, two, two countries um, where, this, where the discourse of communal violence is, is, is very common, uh, Nigeria and, and South Sudan. Sorry, in South Sudan. This is drawing from, from ACLED data from, from last year. Uh, we can see in the uh, top left corner in, in northwestern Nigeria all those kind of orange dots. Um, those are uh, cases, cases of uh, communal violence, which is often described as being between vigilantes and, and, and bandits. Uh, in South Sudan, as you can see from the light blue here, the types of actors usually associated with communal violence Okay, so identity militias, self-defense groups, that kind of thing, uh, have become increasingly prominent in patterns of violence, particularly since the 2018 peace agreement. Now, the way in which the governments in these countries describe this violence, they're, they're very keen to emphasize its intercommunal nature. Uh, they're, they're keen to emphasize it as being essentially apolitical. And they're very keen to distance themselves from that violence. Okay, so in Nigeria, as I mentioned, its violence is being presented as be being between bandits and vigilantes. These are euphemisms for um, uh, Fulani pastoralists as bandits and Hausa farmers uh, as, as vigilantes. In South Sudan, the state claims it has, uh, th th this violence is either you know, inter-ethnic, inter-clan, or linked to unknown gunmen, uh, which is usually understood to be uh, the, the security services in, in reality. And, and a lot of this stuff is reproduced by donor governments, by the UN, by other agencies who, who, who uh, kind of buy into this, these, these sets of claims. Uh, I mean, in, in, in the case of Nigeria, we see um, that, that actually what, what happened here was local elites tended to sponsor the different groups, uh, these, these what became bandits and vigilantes, uh, and then they lost control of these groups. In the case of South Sudan, we often see that elites are closely linked to the formation and maintenance of these groups and will sometimes violently disarm them as well when they become too much of a problem or, or, or they risk defecting to somebody else. Now, uh, this graphic shows uh, part of uh, southwestern South Sudan, it's Western Equatoria state. Uh, last year, there was intensive violence in, in Tombora, which is t to the far west. Now, this violence was being presented as inter-ethnic between the, the Zandi and Belanda, even though these groups have no real history of, 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 of serious violence. Um, and that's because, in reality, what was going on here was this was a set of inter-elite um, among the Zandi community, uh, an inter-elite power struggle that was ethnicized uh, in order to, to allow elites to advance their particular claims. There was also some economic incentives to monopolize control of the border with the Central African Republic. In Warap State, where most of South Sudan's elites come from, um, there was a very complex violence in 2020, some of which involves local elites um, who were raising militias, but also involved national elites. Um, there was a, a power struggle at the apex of, of South Sudan's very complicated security system, where elites close to the president were getting worried about the spy master, uh, Kol Kirkuch and decided to um, attack his power base and his militias under the, the, the pretense of a disarmament campaign. Now, that culminated in a fight that killed almost 150 people in August of 2020, uh, and which Akolka's militias won uh, against the state. Thank you. Okay, so if there are these different problems that accompany the, the, the term of, of, of intercommunal violence, what can we do to um, overcome these or, 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 to, or to mitigate against them or even replace this? Now, I think there's a few things we can do. I think one of the, the, the most obvious ones is to be alert to the kind of elite interests 
uh, and the role of elites in manufacturing these types of conflicts. Um, that, that also elites are very, very capable of making conflicts appear random and anarchic, uh, but that's not necessarily what's actually going on. Uh, they can, uh, I, I don't mean to suggest that we kind of become conspiracy theorists who are always looking for uh, elite interests there, or it's always the elites meddling, follow the money or, or anything like that. That, that. that would be going too far. There are, of course, instances where elites are not involved, or they were involved in the past, but are no longer involved. Um, but nonetheless, I think it is something we should be kind of wary of. And my, con my final point is to consider and situate the types of actors within uh, that engage in so-called communal violence within the, the, the kind of the architecture or the political and military systems that they inhabit and often form quite an important part of. And this can change over time. Uh, so this is a graph from, from last year in South Sudan. Now, in terms of thinking about or rethinking about communal violence, I found it helpful to actually split it into different types of violence. Okay, some of these overlap, as kind of indicated on this different graph, but we've got, generally, we're talking about how closely this type of violence and the actors are linked to the, the national level elites on one end of the continuum and how distant they are on the other end of the continuum. Now, these groups can move across, and can and do move from being and a kind of an elite proxy army uh, into being discarded as a kind of irregular militia potentially targeted for disarmament. And they can then make a kind of revival in subnational uh, contest between, between local elites. Uh, but I think if we consider the degree to which these actors associated with intercommunal violence, the extent to which they are integrated or disintegrated from these systems, and consider and break apart the different types of violence they're actually involved in. I think we get a much richer understanding of what's actually going on. I'll leave it there. Thank you. <laughs>